So I would like to welcome, say welcome to everybody today uh, here at the uh, presentation of uh, Jacobo Di Stefani, who has uh, a couple of years, since a couple of years, been preparing a work entitled Towards Multivariate, Multi-Step Ahead Time Series Forecasting, a Machine Learning Perspective, a work which he would like to uh, present today in order to obtain the degree of Doctor in Computer Science at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. He has worked on this team under the direction of uh, Professor uh, Gianluca Bontempi, and today his work will be uh, assessed by a jury um, of, who, of which the members are Louis, Professor Louis Torgo at Dalhousie Dal University in Canada, Professor Sueb Bentaib of the Université de Mons, Professor Hugues Bersini of the Université Libre de Bruxelles, uh, who is a secretary, and me, uh, Martin Janssen, Professor Martin Janssen, who is acting as the president today. Um, the procedure today will be as follows. First, uh, Mr. Jacopo de Stefani will present his work during uh, 45 minutes. Then afterwards, the jury members will have the opportunity to ask questions, um, starting with Professor Torgo, then Professor Bentaib, then Professor Bersini, then Professor Janssen, and then uh, Professor Bentempi. And after they have uh, asked their questions, the uh, occasion will be given to the floor, to the public, to the audience, also to ask questions, give comments or suggestions. Then afterwards, the jury will uh, go to another meeting room in, in teams where they will deliberate. And then a few moments later, the result will be announced. So I suggest, unless there is a first re or fire quick remark, that uh, Mr. Stefani will start his presentation. Can you all hear me? Can you all see my screen? Yes. It's without further ado, thank you, Professor Janssen, for the introduction. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm here to present my PhD thesis work titled Towards Multivariate and Multi-Step Ahead Time Series Forecasting, a Machine Learning Approach. As the title is quite a mouthful, I will now start the presentation just by decomposing this title and going through the all different aspects to make it more accessible and more available to, to you, to the public. So, first of all, what is a time series? In the context of this presentation and of this thesis, a time series is a numeric time series, which is basically, as we can see on the right, in a tabular form, a table, a sequence of number indexed by time. Most commonly, is it is found and it is presented in the, the visual form, the one we have on the left hand side, in which the time is the independent variable and the value is the dependent variable on the time. But what we are interested in in this thesis is the problem of forecasting a time series, which is the idea of having a set of previous value, of t previous value, and trying to forecast a set of future value up to h observation. And we make two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is that the, uh, there is an autoregressive dependency, meaning that in order to forecast the future, the information to forecast the future is in the past, and that there is a model error. So that since we are making a model of the to predict this, uh, this time series, there will be an unpredictable error. And in more formal terms, there is an unknown function that we want to estimate with an error term which has a uh, uh, null mean and a specific variance. So in practice, what I presented is a case of multiple step ahead. And the main difference is that, as we can see on the left, left hand side, one step ahead consists in forecasting only the immediate next step in the future. Multiple step ahead focus not on only in one step, but up to each step year uh, five to be forecasted. And in order to estimate this unknown function, we need to make a transformation of the, of the data we have. This is the tabular data we have seen before, and we do a procedure which is called um, embedding, in which we just separate the data in order to have, on one end, uh, the past value 
up to a certain dependency, in this case is uh, three values, up t, t minus one and t minus two, which is called the model order. And for each pair, we associate the target. And in that way, we will be able to teach to a machine learning model how to make a link between the past, the mod the m previous value, and the, in this case, it's a one step ahead, the value ahead. If we are working with uh, time series uh, and with deep learning in, in particular, there are other formats to embed the data, but the principle is the same. We need to translate from the initial format into a format which is understandable for the machine learning technique we are going to use. And in order to make it more clear, we will define a bit of terminology that will be recurrent in the rest of the, the presentation in which we say that the variable that we would like to predict, so the future value, is also called the target. The value that we know about the past are called the features or the variables, separated uh, for each uh, feature or each variable, it's a different column, like in the previous table. Each line of this table is called a sample, and in order to work with a machine learning model, usually we split in uh, at least two parts this table so that a part is used to make the training to make the machine learning model learn about this function relating the past to the future and then we have a second part which is a testing set to validate the model to validate the performances and this will be useful later on for the assessment but so we have defined univariate time series one step and multiple step ahead. The remaining thing to define is the concept of multivariate time series, which is basically an extension of what we've seen until now. It's still numeric value. Instead of having a single column, a single vector here, we have multiple vector. And if we represent it, it's more than one line. In this case, two, because we have a two dimensional time series. In practice, what are multivariate time series? What uh, problem did we work on for this problem of multivariate time series? A first problem is the problem of wind power forecasting, in which each variable, each measure is represented by the output of a wind turbine, the power, electric power generated by each wind turbine. And the idea of handling it as a multivariate uh, process comes from the fact that those turbines are not independent from each other, are more or likely subject to the same type of, uh, of wind that because they are geographically located closer to each other, which means that probably by tackling the problem of forecasting them not independently of each other, but grouping them together could make us profit from some information from the other turbine to predict the information of a, or the, the values of a specific turbine. And this work has been, uh, has been done, it's the first case study in collaboration with uh, some colleagues in the University of, uh, of Sanio, and we have worked in particular with Italian and Australian wind farm. Another problem that could be tackled as multivariate as a multivariate forecasting with time series is the problem of volatility forecasting in a financial context. What you see here are four time series related to the exchange rate between the four major cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, and Dogecoin, uh, represented across time. What you can see is that there is a general trend here in January 2018 of increasing the value and then decreasing the value, which is common across all the time series. Once again, as in the previous context of wind farm forecasting, this might be an indication of a common underlying uh, phenomenon that is guiding all these, uh, these time series, and that could be easily forecast if we consider that the problem of multiple time series rather than focusing independently on each univariate time series. And this work is part of a, another in collaboration, this time industrial collaboration, that I did with the Atos World Line company, focusing mostly on the French stock market and cryptocurrency data. And so 
once we have put all together, the, the only remaining thing is how to present, how to perform this multiple step ahead forecasting. And the regular way is just to have a one step ahead model, fitting a model that is trying to predict for a single time series, one step ahead, and using different strategy. First strategy is the recursive strategy, which takes this model, does one prediction, takes the prediction, put it back into the model, and iterate the prediction each time to obtain the each step forecast. Another approach is to have each different model, each one, each one at one step ahead, one focusing to predict at T plus one, one at T plus two, so on and so forth, at, up to T plus H. And then there is a third strategy, which is a joint strategy, which is a single model that does the H, all the H prediction at the same time. And this will be basically the tool we will be dealing with, we will be presenting in the rest of the presentation. So in terms of contribution, what are the, the, the contribution of my work? First of all, as in any research work, I started by having a look into the state of the art for multivariate and multi step ahead problem. Then I noticed a lack of the, the formalization of this problem, and I provided myself a new uh, formalization to tackle this problem of multivariate and multi step ahead problem. And then I developed two novel forecasting strategies the DFML and the SMURFS that we are going to see later on in the presentation in detail, based on traditional machine learning approach. And finally, we will present uh, some extract of the empirical assessment of these two different strategies. For the state of the art, the problem of multivariate and multi step forecasting is not a novel problem. It has been studied for several years in the literature. The first paper dates from the 50s and mostly deal with traditional technique, what we see in blue on the right hand side. Traditional technique that are based on a statistical model and normally, and that they try in the simplest case, like the naive model, just use the very last available prediction as a future prediction, try to use an average of the prediction in the average case, try to model a not regressive dependence, but across different time series of so vector autoregressive, or PLS. More recently, we have seen an explosion of the model related to deep learning, to technique using deep neural network, black box model in which we just give the available data. There is no analytical statistical model defined, but it's rather the machine learning technique that learned from the, the data, the best available representation from uh, the, the, the data that is given. And that these are normally tackled with recurrent neural network, which are especially developed for time-dependent signal, convolutional neural network, and uh, multitask learning, trying to uh, join together once again, predicting multiple individual tasks like, like we did before with a single network in order to exploit uh, the interdependency among the tasks. And there is also a minor uh, niche in the literature about kernel technique, kernel methods, multivariate extension of subtle vector uh, machine or kernel regression. But what I noticed, it was there was a lack of traditional machine learning technique, and this is where our contribution lies in having added a multi-input, multi-output uh, strategy um, called the DFML, and a strategy based on, on a decomposition in a many multiple input single output problem, which is a Smurf strategy. Why, with this, even though that's the predominant uh, approach in the recent year, why didn't we focus on deep learning? Because actually what we analyzed, what we, we found in the literature is that if we look at this plot, it's just highlighting the error, average error of the model, and the number of computation of floating point operation which are required to get to this amount of error. And we have seen that 
you can see that uh, almost 10 years ago, we had a high rate of error, relatively simple uh, models, but with a lot of error. And then the more we advance in the year, the more we reduce the error, but also the more we augment the number of operation, the complexity of the model, and conversely also the energy consumption, the, the carbon dioxide emission, which are growing rapidly and reaching a very, very large level. So what we aim, what we were searching for is to look at uh, the literature, look at what's existing and see if there existed a, an alternative way, maybe by reducing the computational complexity, but still gaining, obtaining a um, certain performance for our model. And so, as I was saying, there was a lack of um, problem formalization, and we decided to bridge the gap between univariate and multivariate. And so what we've seen up until now are mostly single input, single output model. There is one time series that goes in the model and it predicts one time series for each step ahead. What we did in our work was first working with multiple input, single output. So taking advantage of other time series as input, but still predicting only one time series as an output, and eventually reaching to the point of having a full multiple time series in input and multiple time series in output, some MIMO model. And so for tackling multivariate problem, we identified uh, three major categories of approach. The first one deals with decomposing the uh, time series, the multivariate time series, in a set of individual univariate time series. We can see here the yellow one, the green one, the red one, and the blue one. And so we decompose, and for each time series, we fit a separate model, as we fit a separate unknown function that we would like to estimate. Then we could have a meso, multiple input, single output, in the sense that we are going to predict also only one time series, but using multiple time series as input. Because the information contained in other time series could be beneficial to the prediction of the single time series that are, we are predicting as out. Finally, there is the MIMO approach, tackling directly the problem as a multiple input, multiple output, and we have uh, noticed that either we can start by tackling uh, the problem as a one step ahead, multiple input, multiple output. So a single time series, so sorry, a single value, a vector of value in output, one for every time series that we want to predict. And once we define that, we can just easily translate and reuse the forecasting strategies we have uh, seen and that has been developed in the, in the literature, such as the iterated strategies or recursive strategy in which we take the one step ahead MIMO model and we reuse it each time to obtain the prediction, a direct model fitting each separate MIMO model, and finally a joint model, which is outputting in this time to not be a vector but a matrix because it it's a matrix of n time series for each time step in the future. And so once we define that, we can move on to the forecasting strategy that we, we have developed, starting from the dynamic factor machine learner, DFML, the, the third strategy we, we developed. Once again, the dynamic factor model is a model that is already well defined in, uh, in the econometric literature. And the idea is that if we have a multivariate problem, the forecasting of our time series uh, capital Y, with a large dimensionality, we would like to transform this problem in a problem with a smaller dimensionality, knowing that there might be a small number of factors of latent factors that account for the dynamics of the original time series. 
And so the idea is to transform the problem of forecasting a lot of time series, the Y time series, in forecasting less time series, the, the Z time series. And this dynamic factor model approach has two sub problems. First of all, we need to estimate the factor, and then we need to forecast the factor. But to make it more clear, I will just provide a quick example. So let us assume that these are the volatility, the financial data we, we have. We have our Y variable that are seven time series for the sake of representing them. In practice, in our approaches, those time series goes to the hundred or mm, more to the thousand of, of time series. From this original time series, we can extract a series of latent factor. And with the combination of this latent factor, we can reconstruct the original time series. And if we have a look at the original and the reconstructed, you see that there is a difference. It's not perfect. There is a reconstruction error indeed. So this is the key idea behind dynamic factor model. Estimating a factor, working on a reduced number of factor, forecasting the factor, in this case with a vector or autoregressive model, and then reconstructing the original time series to obtain to transform the forecast of the factor into the forecast of the original time series. And the approach is summarized here. So our contribution here is in the fact that the Factor estimation normally is done only using principal component analysis, using a linear technique, while in, this case, in our case, we introduced also non-linear techniques such as uh, shallow or deep mounted encoder or recurrent autoencoder for the dimensionality reduction. So as a, an alternative to find the factor that we have there. And for the forecast, on the other end, in addition to VAR, we implemented a set of traditional benchmark winning uh, or win competition winning approaches, such as uh, the exponential smoothing teeth and combined approach, and some machine learning techniques such as lazy learning and gradient boosting. In addition, we provided also some extension to the original DFML contribution, which is just the framework I presented here, which is in allowing this factor estimation to be done incrementally. So using a technique that will not require to tackle all the data, which is in the hundred of time series, as I said before, at the same time, but rather using one sample, one element at a time, and automatic hyperparameter search strategy in the sense that the number of factors that we have to choose here is a parameter that is up to us to decide how many latent factors there are. With the use of this automatic technique, we will be able to do that uh, automatically without human intervention. And so in order to validate our approach, we tested in the thesis, there are three major use cases, three major uh, examples, one on factor estimation forecasting, one on volatility forecasting, and one on automatic, uh, automatic hyperparameter search and iterative factor estimation. And as you can see, those are series that have uh, in the uh, thousands of samples and in the hundreds of time series, so very large that cannot be easily uh, represented or deal with traditional techniques. So here in this presentation, we will focus mostly on the factor estimation and forecasting assessment. And we are going to do that with a rolling window approach, meaning that we tested several times on several different parts of the time series. Here we have an example with two. We took a period in the past for training and we use a period in the future for testing. We and we repeated that several times, up to 20, 30 times, in order to have a more robust statistical assessment. And then we computed a narrow metric. We computed basically the difference between the real value and the value we have predicted across all the, the different time series. And then we normalized 
with respect to the naive method in order to have a more interpretable result. We tested all the different strategies I presented before, and we tested for several forecasting horizons in the future, from four to 24 hours. And the results are shown through uh, Friedman, Friedman statistical test, which is this representation. Basically, we tested all the different configuration, and here you can see a ranking of the method. So the leftmost is the best, the rightmost is the, the worst, and we consider here only the top 20 of the methods. A black bar connects the methods that are not statistically sig significantly different. And what we can see here is that, in general, there are, even in the top 20 of the techniques, there are still univariate techniques which are a uh, tough competitor to, to beat, even if the problem is indeed multivariate. What we have observed here is that our technique, what we, we provided, generally outperform the naive technique, generally outperform the benchmark technique, which is a good result. And that if we look here, the very best technique, this is one result, but in the thesis, we have shown also across different data set that consistently PCA linear technique in combination with a traditional machine learning technique, lazy learning, is among the top performance, but also that other te machine learning techniques such as recurrent and shallow autoencoder are obtaining competitive performance. So there is here an alternative to um, deep learning as machine learning technique to make this forecast uh, of multivariate data. What we compared also is not only since our interest was in not only the forecasting accuracy but also the computational time, we compare different dimensionality reduction technique based deep GRU and LSTM with our technique with the um, so, sorry with a linear technique PCA, because all of these techniques are part of our DFML. And what we observe is that uh, if in this table, you can also see the, the very small line at the bottom, the univite approach, which are still very cheap in terms of uh, computational complexity, but still producing top 20 good results. But we can see that if we are using linear technique such as PCA, we can also greatly reduce the computational cost and still have good forecasting performance, even better than the technique that are using uh, neural or shallow and deep uh, the dimensionality reduction techniques. So, Across the different assessment, what we have uh, seen is that lazy learning and VAR are consistently among the top performance. So if we had to advise which technique to use within the DFML, that would be our, our suggestion. And that um, also nonlinear factor estimation technique, which haven't been explored that much in the DFM uh, literature, have been doing um, comparable forecasting performances, but their computational cost is higher compared to linear technique with traditional machine learning. And what we would like to stress also as a point is that univariate technique are often neglected in, a, in the assessment in the literature, but as we have seen in our assessment, are often tough competitor to beat. So this concludes the um, part about uh, the DFML, and we allow us to move on to the second strategy, the, the selective multivariate to univariate reduction through feature engineering and selection Smurfs strategy in the show. So this strategy has been mostly motivated by the problem of wind power forecasting that we analyzed before, because of two reasons. Here you have a small overview of a wind power system in which you have some wind turbines that are connected to a substation that is controlling these turbines. In this case, there are 
offshore. In our cases, we're more onshore. But this substation is connected to a transmission system that is going then to transfer the energy produced by the wind turbines into the transmission network. There are two main actors here in this uh, context. On one end, we have the owner of the wind farm, of the wind park, which signs some contract with the transmission system operator. And signing this contract means that he has to guarantee a certain amount of produced power in order to fulfill the needs of the transmission system operator. The problem is that wind turbines are an intermittent source of generation. So in order to make good contracts, good estimation, the owner of the wind farm need, for economical reason, to have accurate forecast of the production of the wind turbines on one end. On the other end, the transmission system operator, the one managing the transmission line, needs to ensure the safety of the transmission system, need to avoid overload of, uh, of current in the, in the system. So on the other end, they need also accurate forecasting to ensure that the line is safe and that everything and that there are no problems. So there are two entities, both of them have requirements concerning this uh, need for, uh, for forecasting. And the problem in the specific case of uh, this, um, this uh, wind farm uh, problem is that the intermittent nature or the fact that the transmission system operator need to reduce the emission of energy to the, the station need a specific way to be tackled. And the approach we developed, we designed in order to tackle this problem is the, this strategy to have a feature engineering process first, in which we start, we take, in this case, it's a decomposition, so we tackle each time series individually. And for each time series, first, we perform a feature engineering process, which means that from the original time series, we created dedicated time series that are relevant for the problem we are analyzing. More precisely, here we have an example of the original time series, and we have a, an example of statistical feature. We basically compute, we take a value, we take a time window of a size W, in this case it's 20 time units, and we compute some statistics over this time unit, and we can see the yellow one on top is the max, and we can see that it, it allows to track the peak, the uh, higher peak. The minimum allows to track the lower peak in our time series. The mean allows to track the general trend, same as the median. So different values are computed across a time window that is rolling across uh, our time series, and that will allow us to have a new variable, so a new column basically that is added to, to our matrix to be used for the prediction. So statistical, quantiles we are, that are measures of the distribution, the zero and 100 quantile com correspond to minimum and maximum, but we can have 25 and 75 quantile percent to um, give us also better information about intermediate point into the distribution. And this again is our approach to extend the initial knowledge of a single time series we have with supplementary knowledge that could be useful for the prediction. And to tackle the specific problem of intermittency, we, desire, we devised here two strategies, two um, new approaches, two new feature engineering approaches, which are the constant detection one, the one based on detecting when there is a variability of the time series, which is lower than a certain threshold. And you can see the yellow one here, which goes up to one that activates when we see that there is a constant period in the time series 
or like here when there is a variable period, but the variability is not high, like in this period here before, but is really small, like here. Or a another approach with run based on a run length encoding uh, that is basically allowing us to detect a sequence of constant and equal to each other values, and both of them are have been developed and have been used for this specific wind power problem to tackle the problem on one end when the uh, wind power, the wind turbine is deactivated and so the, this production goes to zero suddenly, or when it's very limited and very reduced and its, uh, its production oscillates around zero with um, a smaller frequency. So to tackle this specific problem, we have to come up with new additional knowledge to be given to our specific machine learning model. And after having done this process of feature engineering, we started with one time series, we reached to CFE time series, more than one. Then we perform a feature selection or feature transformation. We have seen PCA before, Either we take all our time series and we reduce them to a reduced number of, number of factors that capture the behavior of the whole time series, or simply we eliminate through a technique used called MRMR, we eliminate the redundant uh, time series with the redundant information. For instance, in the case here, if we have max and mean, and we have quantile zero and 100%, they give exactly the same information. So they are not needed, both of them. So a technique used maximum, uh, minimum redundance, maximum relevance, MRMR, allows to select and filter out only the very relevant time series, so to reduce the number for uh, the prediction. And then, we use a technique which has also been, have been proven quite effective in the literature, which is the technique of ensembling. Instead of using a single model to make a prediction, we put together several different models, and the scientific literature tell us explicitly that heterogeneous ensemble, so ensemble composed by models of different types, tend to have better forecasting accuracy than model that are composed by, um, so there's ensembles that are composed by model of the same type. So we tested as benchmark univariate model, such as the naive, the average, artificial neural network, gradient boosting, random forest, lazy learning, and SVM. And for our specific Smurf strategy, we tested a whole series of different combination of ensemble. What is relevant here is that we tested both a simple average ensembling, so having a separate model, each of them making a prediction and then taking the average of this prediction, or a more clever adaptive ensembling, taking into account the average but weighted by the inverse of the error, so giving more weight to those that make less error, or combining also several versions of the ensemble across time. And this is, in the end, what I'm going to present you in, in this, uh, in this uh, presentation. It will be a particular implementation of the DAF uh, strategy with, for feature engineering, using a moving average, minimum, maximum, quantile, and the two custom technique I explained you before. For feature selection, we will be using MRMR, so no transformation, just filtering. And we will use the DAFT-E, which is an ensemble adaptative, but in between ensemble, but also adaptative, taking into account the historical performance of our ensemble. And we approach this on a problem of uh, wind power forecasting. 
on 12 hour, we employ the same rolling window approach as before, training on the past, testing on the future, and repeating several times, but by shifting the windows. And we use again a error metric, which is based on the naive model. What we did in addition, because of the motivation I was explaining to you before, is that we didn't only focus on the single value of the prediction, but we look at the distribution of the, the, the prediction. We looked at across all the different cases, at the standard deviation and the mean of the error, with that meaning that if we consider the, the point one, something which is closer to the origin here of the plot, it's a plot that has a low value for a variance, so the variance of the prediction is low, and also the mean of the error is low, so the accuracy is good and it's not that viable. Conversely, the point four has a high error and high variability, and two and three are the intermediate configuration. And what we did to assess here, it was to represent the extension, the area of the different model, to look across the different forecasting horizon and the different type of model, how well our model was performing. And we compared in this plot the, our technique, the ensemble technique, and all the different ensembles, uh, sorry, the different individual techniques that are composing this ensemble. What we can see in this plot is that if we look at the black area, the one of the DAFT, it's something which is concentrated closer to the origin. It is, uh, so it has a low value, low dispersion for the mean and low value for the, the variance, with that meaning that the prediction is quite, it's accurate and also quite stable. While if we look, for instance, at exponential smoothing or LSTM technique, we can see that they have a higher uh, value of the of the mean, with that meaning a bigger error, and also they are more extended in the plot, with that meaning there is a, an increased variance, which is what we would not like to have, since both the transmission system operator and the owner on, of the wind farm care about having predictions that are on one end accurate and on the other end robust, with a um, with too much variability, without too much variability. And so in the thesis, we discussed also another approach, a simplified approach, which is the DAF E without the temporal element of aggregation. And both are based on heterogeneous ensemble. In our use case, they have proven to be confirming what has been uh, already discussed in the literature, that they are a valuable tool heterogeneous ensemble that allow to provide accurate forecasting. When we introduce the, the memory component in the form of a forgetting factor with the DAFT, -E, we have even better performances with respect to the DAFT -E, and we get to more robust estimation of, the, of our forecast. And what was surprising also in the, in the DAFT -E that we, we tried is that we tried to combine the same family of model, the random forest here, but using a different subset of feature. And this has been also proven effective in uh, reducing uh, the, the forecasting error and improving the forecasting accuracy. So this brings me to the conclusion of this, uh, this thesis. And the idea is that here we have uh, seen, diff that we have first looked at the, the literature and we have seen that algorithms and methodology from the traditional machine learning literature has been often neglected because the literature focused mostly on econometric traditional approach like VAR, VARMA approaches or deep learning. Nevertheless, what we have shown with our experimental assessment is that if we put our machine learning uh, technique into tailored strategies, we can still obtain good forecasting performance with a reduction in terms of com computational complexity and consequently energy consumption for the same level of 
performance. In the end, this was the, the work that I, I carried out throughout six years. There are still research perspective, further extension that could be done. We could study the application of neural technique, which has been proven successful, especially for uh, data that has long-term dependency within them, inside our strategies and see how they work. We could approach in problem that are hierarchical structure, with that meaning that we can aggregate at different level the individual time series that, that we have, a specific hierarchical approach that works better with this type of problem. And then we could also consider, since we had already developed a part about incremental um, uh, incremental feature estimation, uh, incremental factor estimation, streaming online extension for big data application. To conclude, so the work I presented here has been published in for the DFML in three articles. One of them won also the Honorable Mention Research Paper Award in the DSA conference and two journal paper in the International Journal of Data Science and Analytics and in Frontiers of Big Data. The uh, strategy of Smurfs has been also published in two journal articles, Technology and Economics of Smart Grid and Sustainable Energy, and IEEE Transaction in Sustainable Energy. And in addition, we also developed a European patent on the, the work mostly on, uh, on vol volatility in collaboration with industrial partner, as well as a couple of publication in terms of volatility forecasting and AutoML in automatic tuning uh, of machine learning model for time series forecast. The work I presented here is also available in form of R packages that are available publicly on GitHub that allow you to reproduce the error measure, the experiments, and the benchmark technique, mostly. And for the, the very last thing, I would like to give a special thank to the collaborators that I had throughout the year, but more specifically to Worldline for the financial support at the beginning of the, the thesis and the fruitful scientific collaboration, and for the second part of my work, the collaboration with uh, the uh, Università degli Studi del Sanio in southern Italy, which is still an ongoing project. So with that, my presentation is concluded. If you want to have a look at the entirety of the thesis, you can scan the QR code on this available slide. But if not, I'm open to any question or comments for both the jury and the public. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Stephanie. Uh, so it's uh, now time uh, for the questions, but before proceeding to the question, I'd like to mention that this public uh, presentation is actually a follow-up, is actually a second defense. There has been a private uh, presentation and interrogation uh, on uh, January the 14th. And so the questions that you will now hear from the jury are follow-up questions, a bit general than the detailed um, discussion that we have had with the jury and on the basis of which we have uh, granted permission already to uh, present this, this thesis for the official uh, presentation. So uh, that being said, I think I uh, give the floor to Lu Professor Luis Torgo to ask his questions. Thank you very much. Um, so. Uh, uh, good afternoon. I think for you it's good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, so, and in particular, congratulations to Jacopo to reach this uh, stage. Um, um, and, uh, you know, um, as I mentioned before, I like very much your work, the work that was carried out uh, during your uh, thesis and that you uh, very nicely presented, uh, you know, the major uh, topics during this presentation and um, I think it's an important work uh, um, because time series are in effect you know uh, present in almost uh, you know a large variety of uh, domains 
and the facility with which we collect data through sensors and things like that and you know devices that automatically collect data just increase this need for studies on a time series uh, and so uh, forecasting is uh, an important part of these studies so i think you know it's very good to see phd is addressing this uh, very important uh, uh, domain uh, uh, of application of data science in general okay so um again i like the contributions of your thesis uh the addressing multi-step ahead and multivariate uh which are you know the main problems that you are addressing are very important i think the the contributions that you um presented although i would not personally uh you know tag them as like major breakthroughs in terms of what existed, I still think that they are uh, novel enough for me at least to 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 be uh, be you know awarded a PhD thesis, a PhD title on uh, computer science. And so uh, but I would like to discuss some of them of course with you. Um, one of the the motivations and the topics that you start to uh, also in the presentation you start to outline your contribution is the fact that you you kind of see uh, the current work as either being the more classical let's say approaches to time series forecasting and then this trend of using very complex deep learning methods and you you kind of argue that as a kind of motivation for your work that there was some gap here in terms of applying uh, machine learning to, to these sort of problems. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I don't completely agree with that. I think that there are lots of work on machine learning applying uh, to time series for forecasting, but I understand what you mean that uh, you think that there is space for more contributions within the machine learning, you know, the more classical machine learning community because deep learning is machine learning. Okay, but um, so one of the the things that you argue is that uh, uh, if I look at your results, is that deep learning? Uh, I mean. I think that you say that the results are not very, very, very different in terms of the predictive accuracy among all of them, right? Uh, at least that's what the message I got. But you claim that, you know, and on one side, um, the standard approaches uh, are slightly worse in terms of predictive accuracy, but they are very efficient computationally. And on the other side, you have deep learning, which is very complex uh, and achieves, you know, slightly better accuracy and then you are somewhere here in the in the middle uh, claiming you know i improved the accuracy uh, competitive accuracy actually you know uh, better but you know not by a wide margin uh, with some cost uh, additional cost compared to the to the um, traditional techniques did do i get your message overall message uh, correctly or yeah okay so the question is, let's suppose that I'm, you know, someone that has a time series problem. Uh, how would you convince me to really invest in learning your approach because it involves some learning compared to, you know, a very out of the box, simple, uh, you know, auto regressive model or something like that? Do you? Can you really convince me that I should invest on your uh, on using your thesis, your your work? So, so uh, given okay. these results, okay. <laughs> that you Thanks, just uh, Professor Dole, for the, the the interesting comment and the and the question. And I will uh, address in uh, in two parts. I will address first uh, the um, the comment on uh, on the literature. And I do agree that I maybe present it quite strongly in the in the presentation with this distinction between uh, uh, traditional technique and uh, and deep learning technique, and that works with uh, machine learning uh, uh, technique for time series analysis. I do totally agree that exists in uh, in the literature and it's not something novel. What is novel in our technique is that. So far, I have not found uh, in, a, in the literature models that focus machine learning traditional model on the multivariate and multi-separate problem, which 
we, we could agree that is a very niche of uh, or a very specific sub problem in uh, in time series but uh, it, it's correct to, to say that uh, there are uh, already several approaches but what i wanted to clarify is that our novelty is, is in the field of multivariate and multi-step variant so that's for the for the first part and for the second part of the question uh, it's uh, it's indeed correct to say that uh, there are kind of two extremes of the, the spectrum. On one end, simple univariate uh, techniques. On the other end, very complex technique like deep learning one, and that our strategies kind of fit in the middle uh, between the, the two. What I also argue in the, in the corrected uh, version of, of the thesis is that if I had to start to work again on a multivariate problem, what I would do first is use indeed univariate technique as a benchmark because sometimes they will not be enough and so we will require to, to go further. But sometimes already that will be very competitive performance and it will be very tough to beat. Then uh, what I, if this first step, this uh, univariate technique, uh, benchmark technique, are not working for the problem. I would argue that I, in problem of a very large dimensionality with a very high number of variables and a lot of correlation between the, the, the variable, it could be worth to see if with a latent uh, variable approach like, as the, like the, the DFML, trying to reduce the very large problem into a smaller problem, if that could solve the problem. And I think it, for what I've seen also in, in practice in, in my experiment is that there should be uh, an effort and uh, it, it might be worth to invest some time in learning and trying to apply this kind of technique if the number of time series is very large. If it's in, in, the, in the hundreds, uh, either it's blindly going uh, by a black box like a neural uh, network model or trying to um, see if we can exploit something from the correlation, reduce the, the dimensionality as I presented here. But if the problem is uh, small, I would say in the tenth of, of time series, uh, I, I would argue that also my techniques are could maybe be uh, overkill for uh, for such a simple problem because there is a, um, it, it is not as uh, the informative content on this uh, series or the, the reduction the benefit you could obtain by uh, applying our technique will be not as large as uh, in, uh, in larger problems. Okay, so um, so because. Something that you didn't touch is that uh, one potential advantage of the simpler um, univariate, you know, standard statistical approaches is that you get, you typically, uh, not always, but you typically get some model that you can really understand or interpret, right? Which is not the case of your approach or the deep learning approaches. So, uh, or it is at least not so obvious. Uh, so, uh, that may be an issue, right, for some applications or for some end users, right? Uh, do you plan to do some efforts in terms of uh, trying to, to make your models more interpretable? Um, or do you, you don't think that's important for? No, I, I do think that the interpretability of the model, it's, uh, it's relevant and it has been one of the, the limitation, most, mostly in terms of time. If I had uh, more time by the end of the thesis, I was trying to explore more, uh, having a look into the dimensionality reduction, how, how to, to visualize, how to interpret. And I do, I do totally agree that uh, one uh, future perspective uh, that uh, that could be for this work is um, is to focus on interpretability of uh, of the result. The, the problem is also that if you have uh, the, the, a single model. In itself, it could be interpretable, but if you have thousands of time series and you have thousands of, of individual model, 
I, I, I could uh, argue about the interpretability of having a thousand of models, but individually it, it would be still uh, more interpretable than, uh, than our approach. That's, uh, that's true and uh, that's, uh, that's something uh, I would like to explore in the future, definitely. Yeah, I agree with you that, I mean, if you have thousands of time series, then uh, it's hard to think that you have one model, whatever, that is uh, interpretable. But still, the reason I'm I'm raising this question is that, in a sense, uh, your approach, uh, given this perspective, is near to deep learning because deep learning is also non-interpretable and it's also uh, uh, so I think it's good for you if you are able to differentiate yourself better from the two extremes. And in that sense, uh, uh, your approach seems to be reaching a level of complexity uh, uh, more near to the deep learning approach. Because, and correct me if I'm wrong, how easy, or explain me, how easy it is for a naive user to pick your software and just apply it? Uh, does it require lots of end tuning? Uh, you know, is it fairly automatic? Like, for instance, on the standard uh, statistical approaches, there are you know functions in R that simply you know automatically apply these models, you know, uh, with reasonable results. So you have something similar to that. That because you know deep learning, as we know, typically requires lots of tuning. But isn't that the case of your approach too? So in um. To the ease of use, the the, um, the 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 FMS strategy in particular has been published as a R package, so it's uh, it's installed, it's documented, and uh, I, I think to run a, a DFML model, it should take uh, one line of code, uh, or two or or three, if some preprocessing of of the data is needed, and the major uh, parameter that uh, that needs to be tuned is the number of the latent variable, the number of of components. So in that sense, it would be quite easy to use, quite easy to implement. Then it's um, since we are dealing with, uh, especially in the case of, of the FML, with latent variables, by definition, latent variables are not observable. So the, it will some tuning will be required to get the correct value of the parameter, but we also develop an extension of this DFML technique to employ a, a search strategy to select automatically the the number of uh, of hyperparameter and uh, so the, the number of components, the hyperparameter, and the best uh, forecasting strategy for for the problem. But, at end. So, sorry to interrupt you, but um, was this automatic tuning used in your experiments? And in particular, is when you report computation times, is this automatic tuning also reported or included? With so in, in the result I presented in the thesis, some of them, yes. Uh, those that I presented in, uh, in the presentation, no. The, it's, uh, it was uh, to, to benchmark uh, the uh, the different uh, dimensionality reduction technique, we fixed the number of components and it was uh, set to three in this case, and uh, it was said to be the same because of, of uh, by previous experiment, we, we did some script plot. We tried to to determine what was the, the optimal number for the, the problem at hand, and we came up with this, uh, this number of three because we, we had, we looked at, we didn't see any improvement to go beyond uh, three components, but of course it, it will require some, uh, some, some, some tuning in the, in that sense as well. And the other, the other, the Smurf also requires uh, tuning? Uh... The, uh, the Smurf, uh, no, in the sense that uh, once the, the features are computed uh, automatically. The, the expansion, the feature engineering is done automatically. Then there is a feature selection. Once again, there, there are hyperparameters, which are the number of, uh, of features we, we would like to, to have selected in the end that needs to, to be tuned. But in that sense, uh, we could uh, take the strategy, apply it, and uh, uh, in that case, it's a fixed uh, set of models, for example, in the DAFTI configuration, 
And so it's that feature engineering with that uh, feature selection and that technique. And in that case, it will be fully automatic. Yeah, because then you have the, the ensembles of models. I mean, uh, there are so many things that you can try there. That's why I'm wondering the level of tuning that you require to make this uh, somehow work well in most cases. Because one thing is that you have like these bots and that you show that it works well on many different time series. And so people, you know, naive users tend to feel comfortable to just apply it. And another thing is say, well, yeah, but you know, for some domains, it you may be required to, you know, change the models, change uh, the number of features. So what is your experience with uh, your own systems? Do you think that they are ready for just saying to the users, you know, just apply it out of the box and you'll get most of the times good performance? What is your opinion? In, in the case of um, the, uh, so the FML we tested on several different uh, domains, several different time series, so I'm quite confident, uh, provided that once again that the, the multivariate time series is large enough because we also run some tests on smaller scale time series and uh, it's what uh, also lead us to to think about an alternative strategies to, to the fml for other type of problem because for those smaller problem the fml was performing reasonably well but not as good as it, it is doing in those large scale setting and for the smurf strategy uh, it, to use it as a strategy and to fit to select, uh, as, as you mentioned, if we, we start to going into the, the automatic selection, automatic creation of ensemble, that will definitely require some tuning. But in the format we presented in the DAFTI and we, we publish uh, in, uh, in the thesis, uh, that format, so that, uh, that is with specific feature engineering, uh, the, the only thing that might be changed uh, if the because we had to add this custom feature specifically for this problem, but all the other statistical traditional feature engineering should work in principle on other different problems and heterogeneous ensemble as also your publication as a, or publication of uh, your collaborators uh, have shown uh, work. Uh, generally well uh, in uh, in many different settings. So given that this technique uses inside a uh, heterogeneous ensemble with, in addition, a temporal aggregation, I would say also for this strategy, yes, it should work uh, uh, out of the box uh, reasonably well. OK, so I think I can then conclude that uh, in your future career, if you have any time series uh, problem, you will use your system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, so I guess I should also use it in the future. <laughs> All right, so. Um, so do, do you, you know, wrapping up a bit because I'm taking already a bit of time, so uh, um, do you have any concrete plans in terms of future work, assuming that you are planning to continue this, uh, that you would put on top of your priorities in terms of improving what you have developed? Uh, is there something that you are keen on trying to, to improve from what you have done? Or you just want to forget it and, you know, start from a completely different topic? It's OK, you know, <laughs> it doesn't mean that you don't like your work, but sometimes, you, you know, you work so many years on something that you just want to forget it and start a different topic. No, actually, um, both on, as you mentioned before, both on the on the, the, the strategy and not necessarily only on my strategy, I would like to, to have a, as, a, as a perspective to work more on the interpretability of the model because it, it was something I also had struggled with uh, during uh, during the development of, uh, of my technique, because uh, especially with uh, with large scale uh, data, it's uh, other than looking then at the metrics, uh, testing, uh, configuring, uh, it, it would be good to have uh, something um, more interpretable, something which could easily extract uh, some information in general in, in multivariate time series and uh, 
maybe some criteria. I try, I tried and tested at some point uh, also the concept of clustering to take, start from a multivariate problem, cluster the time series, and then apply multivariate uh, technique, but smaller. But in the in the end, eventually, it was not working that well. So I would say, in that sense, uh, interpretability would be would be on top of my list. And then yeah, th there are some low hanging fruits uh, that, that could be in implemented concretely quite quite easily, such as um, integrating uh, uh, or testing the performance of other technique or looking what I presented in. A, at the end of the of the, the, the thesis, the a big data approach or having a more streaming approach rather than a batch approach, uh, like I was doing at the moment. If I had to to pick two, I would say those two: interpretability and uh, and the, the streaming approach. Okay, thank you very much. So once again, congratulations and uh, all the best for your future. I think from my side, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Torgo, for this uh, nice discussion. Uh, we now give the floor to Professor Ben Taib uh, for his questions. Yes. Thank you. Um, congratulations, Jacopo, for your for your work. Uh, like I said last time, uh, I have myself worked on, uh, on forecasting problems in the past, so I can uh, recognize the challenges uh, in uh, in working in this area. Um, I mean, uh, time series forecasting is actually a fundamental problem in uh, in many in many fields. Like if you look at econometrics, uh, statistics, a lot of things have been developed uh, in the past for for time series analysis and forecasting, but much less in uh, in machine learning. So if you compare that to, for example, classification problems or uh, or clustering problems, like you have state of the art algorithms that works quite well, uh, but but finding uh, I would say uh, good machine learning algorithms that just work on time series data, I always found it quite challenging uh, just because of the uh, the structure in the data, the, the trends, the, uh, the non-stationarity of the data, the, the seasonality in the data, uh, the temporal dependence in the data, etc, etc. So I don't think machine learning algorithms uh, focus on this on these features in general. Um, all right. Um, now, uh, I wanted to, to ask a question actually about uh, time series forecasting in general. So if you think about any well, any learning problem, uh, but let's talk about time series forecasting, you have the data, so you have the class of models you are going to consider. Uh, is it going to be a neural network? Is it going to be gradient boosting, right? The model, let's say. Then you have the loss function. Is it going to be mean squared error, mean absolute error? Is it going to be quantile loss, function, quantile loss, whatever? Then you have the forecasting strategy. Is it going to be recursive, um, direct, etc.? Um, so, if I mean, with your experience uh, in forecasting, so out of data, class of models, loss functions, forecasting strategy, uh, which which one you think is more important? Like, uh, if you have to, you need to do research on, on this type on forecasting in general. Uh, do you need uh, more data will bring more accuracy or is it actually the class of models like uh, it has to be nonlinear or or linear depending on the on your applications? Do you have to be very careful with respect to the loss function, uh, etc.? So that's my first question. And then the second one is um, is related to the difference between univariate and multivariate. Um, so th the point you are making here is I'm working on multivariate. I have extending the work from univariate to multivariate strategies. Um, and my question is again here, what are the major differences? Like I know, OK, univariate, you have one time series, multivariate, you have multiple time series. So can you say uh, more on the differences between the two, not on the challenges, but but more really on the, on the fundamental differences between the two. And finally, the um, the decision problem, because a lot of forecasting uh, algorithm, they produce, they they design new strategies or new algorithms and whatever, and then minimize some kind of loss. But actually, 
everything you have developed, if a company is going to use it, for example, they are going to run your algorithm, then get some forecast, and then use it to make some decisions. And my question is, is it just simple, like just run it and then use it to make decisions, or can you include the decision problem into the yeah, into the forecasting problem? So yeah, that's that's my three questions. So uh, I will uh, I will go first for the the, the first one. If I uh, reformulate, so it was what if we consider a learning process, um, including different step. Uh, the data, the, the class of model, the loss function, uh, the strategy, what is, in my opinion, the most important uh, element? Is that correct? Yeah. So I would say, uh, from my experience, the starting point is always the data, because what I observe, I observe for example, working on the volatility problem, is that it actually took me quite some time to beat the, the benchmark because the problem in itself was quite difficult. And in the, it was no matter, I tested several different techniques, uh, I explored different class of model, but uh, still it was very difficult to beat the, the average of, or, or the naive. And so the solution I came up with in the end was to include additional information. Uh, and move from a single input to um, multiple input. So I would say the data is a uh, run some benchmark on the data first to, to understand. As for the class of model, I, I would say that uh, rather than focusing on a single class of model, generally speaking, ensemble, ensembling work well. So instead of using a single model, I would test an ensemble, possibly heterogeneous between uh, some traditional technique like exponential smoothing that generally works well and gradient boosting. And I expect to, to perform uh, quite well. As for um, the remaining part uh, of, the, of the pipeline, so the loss function and the um, and the, the forecasting strategy, I would say that those will be more problem dependent uh, in the sense that according to the, the specific type of problem I will have to deal with, uh, I will focus on, uh, on a specific uh, type of measure. And uh, that could, uh, could make a link also to the, um, to the third question I think you, you made about how to include the decision process in uh, the, or whether it, it, it makes sense to include the, the decision process into the machine learning procedure. I think that could be one of the advantages of, uh, of a machine learning procedure that uh, if you formulate the problem correctly, so as I tackled it uh, in both univariate and multivariate form, uh, a, it is a problem of, uh, of regression. But it, for some problem, from some decision problem, it might not be really necessary to get the exact value, but rather tackle it as a, as a problem of classification, time series uh, classification, rather that uh, if the decision is, for example, uh, something we had explored also in, during the, the, the first thing of volatility is analyzing volatility and then coming up with a decision to sell or buy uh, the, the corresponding stock. So if you frame the, the problem differently, you could train the, the model, that's the, the, the beauty, I would say, of, of machine learning to include also the, um, what comes after the forecast, so the, the application of the forecast into the, the process itself. And uh, yeah, to, to conclude on the third question, on the second question actually, which was uh, about the difference between univariate and multivariate, I think the some things are, are, are similar, the, the type of data remains the same, it's still numeric data instead of having a vector, now it becomes a matrix, but what is, uh, is more important is that the, I think the, the univariate problem is simpler in the sense that Either we, we, we don't model or we neglect the, the interdependencies between the time series. And 
while dealing with a, a multivariate time series data, it might be the case, once again, depending on the type of problem and uh, the, the specific case that there is a, um, that not all the columns are independent with each other, but there is a relationship. To make a more concrete practical example that I worked on, mobility data. The mobility data I was working on were streets in Brussels, but those streets are a closed system. The, the cars that go out from one street goes in another street. So there is def there's Definitely, there is a, a connection that I could uh, express some relationship. Uh, and I, I would think that uh, in, in that case, for example, a hierarchical approach in which I, I could aggregate uh, and make forecast at different level might work, uh, work better. So to, to um, uh, say in a couple of words, the what I think about the difference is that there might be a structure that in multivariate time series that is not there or that we don't consider if we consider the individual time series. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. Maybe a last comment. Um, so how do you decide the dimension of your problem? Like, uh, imagine if you have a data set with a thousand time series, it's clearly a multivar multivariate time series forecasting problem, but then would you just consider it as a 1000 dimensional forecasting problem? Or, I mean, where do you start? Like if someone give you a, a multivariate forecasting problem in dimension D, how do you decide if it's a dimension D or is it dimension one or is it dimension 10 and which series should you consider as multivariate or not? That, that's, a, that's a good question and I think an open uh, research problem in the sense that what I, I explored up until now is um, what exists in the spectrum, so considering that as fully univariate, considering that as fully multivariate, considering that as uh, univariate but having additional regressors, uh, I think that um, I, I would say that I don't have a, a definitive answer for now, but uh, what I would do for this problem is, uh, as, I, as I tried before, try to see if there, maybe using some time series clustering algorithm, see if there is, exists uh, a, for, uh, a sort of structure or similarities in terms of uh, correlation, um, partial autocorrelation, autocorrelation function. Uh, uh, in the series, that might me. Um, so if I didn't know anything about the data, would be that approach. But otherwise, uh, I, normally, if it, those kind of large scale uh, Problem come from a real world problem, come from a real world situation. So I would also consult with a domain expert to uh, to get more information about the data. Because if I think about if the data um, about the course I'm currently giving, which is about uh, large scale network measurement, uh, if I know that there are network measurement and there is a latency and there is a there are specific events that can affect this uh, this network measurement. I, I think that this could help me also in uh, in having a better idea of the of the dimensionality. Okay, thank you uh, again. Congratulations, and I will uh, let other uh, others ask, ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ben Taif. Um, now the floor is for Professor Bersini. Yeah, <coughs> thank you, uh, Martin. For the sake of time. <coughs> I will not certainly be too long, and also because we already had the chance to discuss with you during the private defense, <clears throat> and also to congratulate you about the excellence of your work. So I, I, I'll be rather brief, and I, I will ask you just a kind of very high level of questions on the possible use cases where your uh, different techniques could be applied. And I have four in mind, which have always interested me for long, and I was just wondering if it would be nice to test your technique on those <clears throat> use case. So just tell, just ask, you know, answer just a yes or not. Uh, <clears throat> and would you be, you know, in, 
inclined to do so. So, for instance, the first one is one that I already discussed with you is the, uh, you know, in, in all cases, you can imagine that as a MIMO problem, you know, multi input, multi output. So, first one would be uh, <clears throat> this uh, use case where you try to predict what some consumers would uh, consume, you know, next uh, based on what they've consumed before. As you know, this is the it's a very hot topic because this is the basis of a lot of recommendation algorithms, for instance, in Netflix, etc. So, for instance, the Netflix, uh, you know, challenge is you could take it as an also a, a MIMO problem. Would that be an interesting problem for you? So uh, we we discussed that uh, already. And thanks for the, the interesting suggestion. And I also had uh, the chance to to have a look and uh, and discuss. Uh, with your former student um, and my colleague Rovan that uh, work on the, that exact uh, problem. I think the problem there was that uh, the methods I developed doesn't work well for uh, uh, discrete events, discrete time series. So oh, yeah. I, I tried at some point, but I wasn't uh, getting some concluding result. Uh, oh. And I think it's because a different type of, uh, of problem. In that right. sense. So another, and, and perhaps you might answer exactly the same thing, because another very hot topic, at least for my groups and also a, a, a bit in the, this, you know, this uh, French initiative, the Wallon initiative on artificial intelligence that we are, John Luke and myself, we are very much involved in. One very hot topic today is, uh, for instance, um, video prediction, like frame pr prediction, so based on the uh, previous frame of the video, you try to, to predict the next one, which is a very hot topic these days. And uh, or you could also extend that to music predictions where you might have a, an orchestra with many instruments. But in that case, it's also a kind of discrete problem because, you know, I don't know, the pixels or whatever. So could, could your uh, techniques uh, apply for those kind of problems? Uh, I, I would say me, for, for music, as in the end, it would be uh, from what uh, I know from my experience, uh, more of a signal processing uh, problem, I think that could get closer and could work better uh, than um, uh, and could be uh, applicable also with my technique. While for for videos, I think in in videos there is also this notion of uh, of locality of the element that. It, there is no, no real independence between the element of the video, but usually they are part of a, of a bigger wall. And from what I've read, from what I've heard in that sense, I, I would say that uh, probably either some video specific pre-processing or uh, deep neural network would be indeed a, a best guess uh, to, to deal with, uh, with this type of data. So I have a, a last one, but not least, because I, I, uh, you might not be surprised, I, I will you know, refer to the COVID crisis, because I remember discussing with Gianluca back in time where we were trying to predict, you know, for instance, if the number of uh, <clears throat> contaminations or, or perhaps the number of access to hospitals and or the number of, of dead people coming. And that was really urgent. You remember back in time, no, obviously we are <clears throat> going to the end, uh, hopefully to the end of the crisis. But... Uh, you may take the data of many countries, you know, that could be the multi-input and you have a lot of time series. In fact, most time series were available, you know, there was a lot of websites, uh, you know, publishing time series on the evaluation uh, the evolution of contamination or, you know, dead people or whatever. Have you tried? Were you, I, I remember discussing with Gianluca about doing some kind of time series technique for predicting what's going to happen in the future. Were you interested in trying your things? Because then you have multi things, multi output, and you have numbers. So would that uh, be I, in this case? I actually don't remember if I tried uh, the DFML or one of these techniques, but I took part in 2020 in a hackathon. Uh, it was organized in, uh, by a Swiss entity and with some colleagues in MLG, we, we actually tried to to come up with a dashboard, but the timing was quite short because I think it was eight, uh, no, or maybe 24 hours. So in the end, uh, we came up with a working dashboard. We could implement uh, some uh, univariate technique, but if I remember well, we didn't uh, manage to get to the point uh, to, to test a multivariate approach. But 
yes, given the, the availability of data, that, that could be uh, it could be definitely a, a pro, um, an interesting proposition. Uh, yeah, would you agree that this in that case, you know, the fact of having many countries and following what's happening in many countries could be very interesting to predict what's going to happen in one country because, for instance, some country can just a bit anticipate what could happen in other countries. Yeah. So the fact of taking whole countries might be very profitable for, you know, the improving the prediction of one country. So in that case, I think uh, using a lot of countries might be very useful. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree that uh, that could be. And also I've uh, from the, the data I found that I search about, uh, uh, it, there is also different grant variety levels, so not only the, the country, but also the region or sometimes even the province. So it, uh, it could make an interesting use case and see maybe what level works the best uh, if uh, just using the country level or if there is some influence at the, the region level or if we need to go lower. So. But I think that even, even if the crisis is declining, I think it's still an interesting use case because you can test what you could have done, and uh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's still worth the trial, and and with that, <laughs> I congratulate you for your work. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Ick. Um, um, so now, in principle, it's uh, my turn, um, but in the interest of time, and because we have already had quite interesting discussions, I will not ask questions. Although I would like to take the opportunity, of course to congratulate you with your nice work and also with your new position at Delft University. Um, so then we have, I have to proceed uh, formally to your uh, advisor, Professor uh, Gianluca Montempi, but I think he's going to confirm that he has no questions at this moment yeah. either. Since you didn't dare asking a question, I cannot. <laughs> so I will have time, of course, I congratulate with Jacopo. I will have more time later just to make my comment on the entire oh, so you are welcome to ask questions. So don't feel. Oh, don't feel. <laughs> we have a lot of interaction, as you can imagine. So thank okay. you. In that case, um, the floor is now open for questions from the audience. So if anyone has a question he or she would like to raise, then there's two options. Either you use the button raise your hand, or you ask a question in the the chat or the the conversation. So if anybody would like to take the opportunity, this is your moment. And yeah, I normally activated the chat, so it should be visible and available now. So. Um, let me see. Um, I don't see any sign of a question coming up. Um, so let's wait a few more seconds. If, if not, then I think this will close the, uh, the first half of the session. So what will happen now is that the jury will withdraw to a secret chamber uh, where a, we will discuss the work. Um, and there is also a couple of administration to be done. Uh, so I expect this to, to last for, uh, say, uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then we will be back with, uh, hopefully, I, I guess so, good news for you. Um, so um, I call now the jury to uh, leave the room here and to move to the uh, secret chamber. <laughs>